Hello, I'm Howard Spence. I'm a blogger and a podcaster and a community activist. I formerly was Eaton County Commissioner for three terms before I retired several years ago. But I still maintain my interest in getting out and about in the community and to uh, raise issues that I think are near and dear to my heart and hopefully to yours also in terms of uh, this legacy that we leave behind this country that's called the United States that presently stands so divided and in such jeopardy of, of losing the democracy that I spent more than 70 years uh, revering and thinking was the best thing in the world and we stand now at a time when that is about uh, to be challenged and that there are many people in this country who no longer believe in democracy, who no longer believe in their neighbors, who no longer believe in people who are not like them. And this past week, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights held another in a series of uh, uh, conferences and training sessions dealing with how to uh, handle the hatred and the division that we now see uh, springing up all around us in Michigan, uh, even here in central Michigan, everywhere in our country, in all areas, people seem to be tired of democracy and they seem not to be able to agree on who is their neighbor and what is the appropriate way for this country to move forward into the 21st century. And this particular conference uh, that dealt with these issues of hatred which was sponsored by the Michigan Department of Civil Rights uh, were videotaped and they will uh, have on their uh, Michigan Department of Civil Rights uh, website the uh, uh, appropriate unedited uh, portions of that conference uh, for the public to see and to appreciate and to con contemplate. But I wanted to uh, share some of the video that I myself took on my cell phone camera when I attended uh, this uh, conference on hate in Michigan and hate crimes uh, this past week. Uh, the conference was at the Kellogg Center at Michigan State University. It was well attended and I was particularly impressed with the quality of the speakers, the knowledge of the speakers, the dedication of the speakers who uh, came from all across the state to talk about how we can make a better and continuing democracy here in Michigan. And this particular uh, video that I am publishing uh, from my own perspective uh, uh, does not uh, encompass the entirety or even a large part of that conference. Very, like I said, talented, knowledgeable speakers. But there were uh, a couple of speakers and presentations that particularly impressed me. And I wanted to make sure that those got publicized and appreciated. And the speakers that I have featured on my video capture of this conference are, are people that uh, impress me particularly in terms of their dedication, their courage, and their willingness to uh, address these issues even though uh, it might make them themselves targets for uh, evil, hatred, uh, basically a lot of sick people uh, that uh, we encounter every day. And the speakers that are featured on my video are Michigan Attorney General uh, Dana Nessel uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kevin Darone Harvell. Uh, both spoke with great passion and I include the entirety of uh, uh, the uh, presentation and speech, welcoming speech, uh, by Attorney General uh, Dana Nessel. I uh, acknowledge I'm a strong supporter of her and what she stands for. I was in that position four years ago uh, when I supported her and I am ever so pleased and thankful to God that at this point in time we have strong women like Dana Nessel, uh, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, and uh, Jocelyn Benson, the, the so-called three witches, uh, running this state and trying to protect us from the evil that uh, was discussed uh, at the conference and that is so uh, prevalent. And uh, by way of introduction, 
uh, to uh, uh, Dana Nessel, I would say, and it shows in, I think, her presentation, that she really is a believer in our democracy. Uh, she is one of those young leaders that are in the pipeline coming along that basically, from my perspective, are the future of this country, of its diversity, of its welcoming nature, of what I call the Christian or uh, uh, empathetic religious uh, uh, perspective of who is my neighbor and getting along basically. And in particular when uh, I heard her speech I recognized the fact that young patriots and people like Dana Nessel were putting themselves out there in the public uh, as targets for the hatred that they were talking about, the people that they were talking about. And that takes a certain amount of courage, uh, especially. And uh, in her speech, she actually takes the time to uh, uh, play the audio of a cell phone message that some uh, bully or some uh, coward behind a, a microphone or a telephone left on her uh, voicemail. And it was, uh, you know, it's disgusting talking about what he wanted to do to her and her children and her family. And this is the type of people that are out there breeding hatred, uh, endangering others, hiding behind the safety of a computer or a telephone, and walking up and down the streets carrying long guns that are semi-automatic, pretending that they are in fact patriots and courageous people when they're basically just cowards ready to cause trouble to cause division, to cause hatred. So uh, I'm going to, with that introduction, uh, go first uh, into uh, uh, the uh, welcoming speech, uh, as it were, by uh, Dana Nessel. And then I'm going to uh, highlight some of the uh, uh, presentation and speech by uh, Dr. Uh, Harvell, uh, which highlights the fact that if we don't teach our kids uh, about the dangers of neo-Nazism, uh, fascism, of uh, uh, othering, which is the, the term used as the uh, principle behind this particular uh, Civil Rights Department conference. If we don't teach our kids these things, they're going to make mistakes that we have seen repeated over and over again in history where democracies fail and where autocrats and theocrats arise and they make other people the target of their venom and so with that uh, I'm going to uh, uh, discontinue my introduction and I ask that you actually take the time I think I think Dana Nessel's uh, presentation is about 20 minutes and Dr. Harvell's presentation is perhaps 5 to 10 minutes at, at most on this particular video uh, this part of his presentation and contemplate what they're talking about, let it sink in, share it with your neighbors. I don't know if it would do good, any good to try to share it with people uh, from the uh, uh, MAGA, Make America Great uh, alt-right world, but uh, it's, it's a truth that needs to be out there. And I'm thankful that there are people brave enough to allow themselves to be targets of such perversion and evil uh, for the benefit and hopefully the survival of our country. So with that, uh, you have a good day and I commend that you go to the uh, Department of Civil Rights website on michigan.gov or else go to their YouTube uh, channel and look at uh, aspects of uh, the numerous uh, workshops and presentations and speeches uh, which I think are valuable uh, to people uh, at this point in time. Have a great day. Right <laughs> well, uh, good morning, everyone. So I want to thank the Michigan Department uh, of Civil Rights for sponsoring this event uh, and for inviting me to speak. I want to, uh, you know, I welcome the opportunity to share what my department has been doing to combat hate crimes and domestic terrorism to twin bat threats that. Um, seek to destroy our democracy. So this year's theme, as noted by Director Johnson, um, the othering of Americans 
is a, sadly a fitting one because this is one where hate and hate crimes begin with the idea that someone is an other or different from you, which then lends itself to the ability uh, to rationalize why we would commit crimes of a hateful nature against them. Hate crimes are an increasingly growing threat to our state. They are messaging crimes that must be answered with a strong message in return, and that is this. Hate has no place in Michigan. As we know, hate crimes are vastly underreported, and it's estimated that only three to 10% of hate crimes are actually reported to law enforcement at all. So I, I came to the Office of Attorney General before having um, found it and having been the president of a group called Fair Michigan. And all we did, all day, every day, was battle hate crimes committed specifically against the LGBTQ community. Um, and we did so in partnership with um, uh, Wake County Prosecutor Kim Worthy, and I know that Kim Towns is here today, uh, who is the new prosecutor for that organization. Um, and, you know, I, I want to thank people like Kim Worthy who recognized that how important this was and, um, and helped to create an entire division in her office just to combat uh, hate crimes committed against marginalized communities. But after having served in that position, and when I took office in 2019, I made it a priority to dedicate resources at the state level to combating hate crimes. And I wanted the residents of our state to know that we will take very seriously any reports of hate crimes against marginal, marginalized communities anywhere in the state and work our very hardest to investigate um, and prosecute those crimes if there is evidence to do so. And to that end, shortly after taking office, we unfortunately had to uh, amend the name of this division. And we had to change it from the Hate Crimes Unit to the Hate Crimes and Domestic Terrorism Unit. Um, sadly, because of many events that were taking place in the state and in the country. So this is a unit that works with both federal and local authorities to ensure that hate crimes and Crimes of domestic terrorism are thoroughly investigated and that they are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And the unit is headed by uh, Sunita Dadamani, who's a career prosecutor who's tried hundreds of cases. Are you here, Sita? You're here somewhere. Here she is. Well, I, I was privileged and honored that she decided to join the department. And um, I think she's done a phenomenal job of getting this unit off the ground. I will say, one of the things I didn't expect uh, was that within just the first few months of uh, being in office, she and I were both called to testify before the Senate Oversight Committee who questioned the need for such a division and wanted to know what our authority was to prosecute such crimes in the first place. And she and I spent about an hour and 15 minutes before that committee explaining that there was something called the Ethnic Intimidation Act which is our state hate crimes law, that had been in effect for over 30 years, that in its day uh, was co-sponsored by such radical liberals as John Engler and uh, Connie Binsfeld. Um, uh, and at the time, was really not very controversial. But we spent that hour and 15 minutes defending, even having such a unit, um, spent years after uh, trying to combat their efforts to defund the unit and ensure that we wouldn't have uh, the um, financial support to even continue our work. Um, and in the period of that, uh, of that testimony and the many, many questions that were asked, not just by the committee members, but by others who decided to randomly join in who weren't even part of the committee, all questioning how we were going to protect people who espoused hateful rhetoric 
but not one question about how we would protect the victims of hate crimes. I welcome you to watch it. It's, I'm sure, still on uh, the Senate website. And it was really telling about um, what was to come for the rest of my term in office, I will say. Hate crimes aren't just an attack on a specific individual, but they're a message to an entire group. And that is why they're so very damaging to communities around our state. And that's why I prioritize partnering with other authorities to combat them. These crimes indicate not just bias, but animus, and yes, hatred. And they target victims because of their race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, or disability. Their otherness. It doesn't matter if the perpetrator was wrong about the victim's identity, if the intent was to do harm to someone because the perpetrator believed they fit into one of those characteristics I mentioned, it is still a hate crime. Our state has a very unfortunate history of domestic terrorist groups. As you know, Michigan is the original home of the Michigan militia and the Michigan, I'm sorry, the militia movement, and as such is no stranger to the threat of domestic terrorism by violent militia extremists. The Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh, who perpetrated the largest act of domestic terrorism in this nation's history, had ties to the Michigan militia. And as something that I said when I was testifying before the Congressional Subcommittee on Homeland Security and Domestic Terrorism, you should know that what happens in Michigan doesn't stay in Michigan. The legitimization of domestic terrorist groups like the Wolverine Watchmen and like the base combined with the toxic partisan rhetoric of today, which is being fed by misinformation and disinformation, has led to a marked rise in militia extremism. And it's helped to create a climate that nurtures and fosters the deep sense of grievance that extremists hold, which often manifests itself in violence. Many of these extremists are driven by and are inspired by white supremacists and far-right ideologies. And this kind of political polarization poses a clear and present danger to our democracy. And it's not just the United States in which democracy is under threat. A very clear line can be drawn from democracy under threat and the events of January 6th of last year when, during a violent insurrection, thousands of people stormed the U.S. Capitol with the intent of overturning a free and fair election and preventing the peaceful transfer of power for the first time since the Civil War. Just last year, six members of the group Wolverine Watchmen were charged by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and my office charged eight people uh, in the group's leaders and associates supporting the terrorist plot. Now, initially, the plot was to take over the Capitol building and start killing people en masse. And they were preparing to kidnap the governor, harm law enforcement officials, uh, hold members of our state legislature, hostage, including some of those individuals who were on the Senate Oversight Committee, ironically, and to destroy our state capitol. Another Michigan domestic terrorist group is The Base, a white supremacist militia that conducts paramilitary training in preparation for starting a race war. Now, The Base gets its name from the literal translation of Al-Qaeda, and four of its members were charged by my office as a result of a joint investigation by the Michigan State Police and the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. Under Michigan law, this uh, extremist militia is a gang. And so my office, for the first time in Michigan history, uh, charged them because when the gang provided the motive, means, and opportunity to commit felonies in this state, that constituted gang-like activity. Uh, and so we charged them with that, and we've charged others with uh, laws that are unique to Michigan, and that actually we're very fortunate to have in Michigan that allow us to combat 
domestic terrorism in a way that other states don't have, and quite honestly, the federal government doesn't have. Our efforts to bring domestic terrorists to justice are hampered when state politicians hold closed door meetings with extremist militia members and stand with them on stages at rallies. After 9-11, a bipartisan consensus was reached on issues of national security. But today, when facing the bipartisan problems of homegrown violent extremism, we cannot even agree to call it domestic terrorism, let alone reach consensus on ways to solve it. Hate does not come just from othering. It also comes from intolerance and fear. Fear of being pushed out, fear of being replaced, fear of someone else's equal humanity. And that fear breeds hate. But there's room for everyone in our American tent. Hate is learned. So teachers and parents and authority figures need to stop teaching it. Remember the adage, children will listen. And as we have seen in recent years, it's not just the children. Adults are just as susceptible to the shrill voice and the relentless urge to hate. And it will take everyone in this room, those who are in the room and those who are not in this room, to eradicate hate crimes and domestic terrorism. And it's going to take many more conferences like this one where we can openly discuss the issue. And it takes resources uh, like the Hate Crimes and Domestic Terrorism Unit in my office in the department. And it's gonna take those who have been victims of hate crimes to come forward so that we can hold perpetrators of these crimes accountable. And um, see, did you write the speech for me? <laughs> oh, all right. Because here's the thing that I read it this morning, and it says, based on what we've already accomplished as a state and a nation, I have no doubt that we have the resolve to make this happen. Except that's a lie. So it's good that you didn't write this. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> now, why do I say that? Because hate is most easily disseminated from top officials who are elected oftentimes down to everyday regular people who ingest that toxic rhetoric and then feel as though they have permission to act upon it. Elected leaders, prominent political officials, and yes, even those in law enforcement. Officials who probably wear Confederate flag masks into the state Senate, who openly talk about assassinating and burning at the stake of their political opponents, who perpetually demean immigrant communities and women in our state, who use white supremacy graphics in their campaign literature, those who brag about their associations with white supremacy and anti-government groups like the Proud Boys, like the Three Percenters, those who refer to the insurrection as legitimate political dissent, and those who routinely label members of the LGBTQ community as groomers. All of that, and the vast, vast majority of those in positions of power to condemn such actions, sit back quietly and say absolutely nothing. It's often said that all it takes for evil to prosper is for good men and women to say and do nothing. And that describes even many of you here in this room who purport to be on the front lines of combating hate crimes and political violence. This exponential rise in hate crimes and domestic terrorism that we're talking about is directly linked to trafficking and bias-oriented, discriminatory, hateful rhetoric by elected and political leaders. 
and it's what allows for regular people to be emboldened to search for the personal cell phone number of the top law enforcement official of this state, who also happens to be Jewish. And you say things routinely like this. You know, it's what leads prosecutors also around the state to say that they can't charge me receiving phone calls like that. Even with a six month misdemeanor, telephone harassment, uh, which we routinely charge in our office, by the way, because it's deemed to be too political. You ran for this position, you know, you knew the rest. We don't feel sorry for you. Okay, well, I'm not asking for any of you to have any sympathy for me. But just know that it's not just me when you have language of hatred against minority communities and it's permitted to go unchallenged when business groups, lobbying firms, and other big money interests continue to support those who rile against minority communities, barely disguising it as opposition to critical race theory or diversity, equity, and inclusion. It incites despicable acts of violence against marginalized communities and against those who have the least resources and who are the most vulnerable to it. It radicalizes those who commit mass shootings in churches and synagogues and mosques and even in grocery stores. So I was at an event um, a few days ago at a high school in Lansing. Uh, and um, one, of the, one of the kids approached me afterwards, after I spoke to the, to the group, in tears. He was uh, black and he was gay. And he said he couldn't stand the continuous taunting anymore about his race and about his sexual orientation. And yet, because the kids at his school had heard it, from some of the highest leaders in the country and in the state that the kids at school routinely called him a pedophile. And, and that he often thought of dropping out of school and sometimes about killing himself. And what I told him was this, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And don't you ever provide the haters out there with your consent. But what I know in my heart is this. Even as Attorney General of this great state, with all the power and all the resources I possess, I can't protect him. Not as long as so many out there, and frankly, so many of you, the people charged with protecting kids like him, and even people like me, won't stand up and refuse to speak out. It is incumbent upon all of us, each and every one of us, to condemn hate speech whenever we hear it and wherever we see it. 
to condemn violent rhetoric, to condemn the mobilization of groups whose only purpose is to terrorize those who look different, worship different, love differently, or originate from other countries than they do. People from all around the world pray for the opportunity to come to this country because it offers them the freedom to be protected from discrimination. And I am only here today because my grandparents fled religious prosecution and persecution in their native land, where each and every member of their families who did not come to America was brutally murdered. And when we refuse to acknowledge that the exact same thing that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler in the 1930s in Germany is exactly the same thing that we're experiencing now here in our beloved United States, then we are destined to repeat that dark, repugnant chapter in world history. When we cover our eyes, or we plug our ears, or even when we say, Oh, it's too close to an election. It's not appropriate for me to say anything. Or when we don't want to risk alienating a political party or our financial supporters or companies that simply say, you know what, we're going to continue to contribute to this demagogue because maybe we'll sell more trucks or we'll be able to lobby for appropriations in the next supplemental bill. Then we are all guilty of aiding and abetting in the conspiracy to commit hate crimes. We're not heroes. We're not champions of the marginalized. We are merely complicit. And we deserve whatever comes next. So I ask all of you to join me in rising up against this scourge on our public dialogue. Rise up against hatred. Rise up against dangerous political rhetoric. Rise up and publicly call for those who use their bully pulpit to demean and diminish others based on their sex or gender or race or ethnicity or their national origin or their sexual orientation or their gender identity and say these people have no place in positions of power. Not in this state and not anywhere in this nation. Do something about it before our country has so devolved into a bastion of bigotry and intolerance that we no longer have the option of saving the people we came to this conference swearing to protect. The choice is yours. You can be righteous and noble, or you can take the coward's way out. The choice is yours. For now. I've given a brief commentary on each one of our panelists, but now I will ask the rest of the panel to take just a couple of minutes to explain the constituents they represent and how they each think about their work. So Aaron and the Attorney General kind of set the stage for you. This is a this is a tough business. But the panelists uh, uh, George, starting with George, as well as many of the people that are involved in breakout sessions for the rest of the day are going to spend the rest of their day telling you about what they're doing to combat hate. This, this conference is called My Response to Hate, Michigan's Response to Hate. So um, why don't we start with Jim. Thank you so much. Okay, my microphone is working. Thank you. Please forgive me. You all saw me take my phone out. I'm not testing. I want to make sure that I'm respectful of uh, time to make sure that my illustrious uh, panelists will ha uh, have enough time. I'm a sociologist, and I normally teach courses that are hour and 20 minutes or three hours long. <laughs> I have to tell my students to let me know that you need a break because I could go all night long. <laughs> so I want to make sure that I'm respectful of time, so I don't want you to think I'm texting. Thank you so much for your inviting me, first of all. Um, it is extremely important, I think, that at a conference dealing with hate, that we do a land acknowledgement, that we are operating on the land that has been confiscated through imperialistic means. 
What this means is that we have an entire system of racialized violence that has been operating since the beginning of the so-called United States in its current form. So we want to make sure that we do that if we're going to be talking about an idea of hate. That's the first thing that I want to do. And as a man dealing in a patriarchal culture, the next thing that I have to do is I have to recognize, it's extremely important, this is about hate as well, in terms of the ways in which misogyny, right, the hatred of women operates within this particular system. As a man, I have to make sure that I, that I, as a man, recognize and say it is the unseen work of black women that allows the black man to go into spaces and be seen as if he is more important than what he actually is. That's why I think I'm an important person. But I know that I have to acknowledge my mom. I know I have to acknowledge my wife. And I have to acknowledge my daughter because they're the ones who get me to the spaces that I'm at and make sure I look good while I'm going down through it. So I want to make sure as a patriarch that we make sure that we acknowledge those folks whose land was stolen again through imperialistic means. Now, the way a thing comes into existence ultimately defines the lifespan of that thing throughout, I'm sorry, it, is, it defines its lifespan throughout its lifespan, right? So the way something comes into existence. So when we look at the so-called United States and the way in which it came into existence, it came into existence through what? Through what? European nationalism. It came into existence through what? European patriotism, through patriarchy. It came into existence through a system, an organized system of white supremacy, which systematically worked to exclude certain people. It is extremely important, particularly when we talk about black people and what we're going to do to uh, identify these people. We have to go back and think about this is extremely important. Walker tells us that the very first publicly funded law enforcement were the people who were defined as so-called slave catchers. Now, I said so-called because when we say slaves, that identifies the totality of those people's being. And so I know that these people were not totally in slaves. I know these people had been enslaved, which means that something happened to them, which means that there was a culture that essentially helped to, precip to precipitate the fact that they were going to be put at a distinct disadvantage every single day. And so I want to make sure that we understand that. And so if this was the first way these were the first folks that were police officers. Think about what they did. That immediately criminalized the idea of being black. It immediately criminalized the idea of blackness overall. Now we, of course, know that after those things were uh, dissolved, after uh, during uh, after re reconstruction, many of those people they had already been trained. So where did they go? They went to the federal military. They joined the state militias and they joined the Ku Klux Klan. If you check me on that, if you check the work of Durham, to essentially assess that. And so when we begin to look at this, what this means is for black people, there's always been a system of what is called symbolic annihilation. Symbolic annihilation is when you use words, images, and ideas to essentially devalue, make fun of, and degrade certain groups of folks. And so when you start off this idea of first calling folks slaves, then publicly funding people to go and get the people who uh, who have the audacity to want to be free, that's powerful. That's powerful. And in fact, let's look at the notion of the audacity to want to want to want to be free. There are all of these constructs that essentially came forth when folks were challenging these things. So for example, Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the so-called Declaration of Independence, uh, the so-called father of modern psychiatry, right? University of Pence of Pennsylvania, those are some powerful cred credentials. Create this ideology of what is called, I don't use this language, but you all know the N, the N word, he called it ingratitude. And he said that being dark skinned was an illness that made people mentally incapable of taking care of themselves. One of his students, uh, of Cart Cart Cartwright, came up with something called this dystopia. This dystopia says that black people and other folks who were not white needed to be taken care of and needed to be managed. And so whatever they were doing was always wrong because somehow they were going to be uncivilized people. He even came up with an idea of what's called dreptomania. And dreptomania says, watch how powerful this is. Slavery was so good that if anybody were to run away, it was obviously because they were mentally insane. And so literally this was a part of this, this was a part of the construct. Now these were people, friends, who were so-called scholars. Think about what they did to essentially impact every single institution, particularly when we talk about education and how that has now trickled down into now. And so right now, I'm hearing some wonderful stats and things, but the one thing I want to make sure I point out is that this is a part of the culture. And what is culture? Knowledge, values, beliefs, and material objects passed off from person to person, one society to the next, and one generation to the next. And so when we start talking about there's a rise in these crimes, and no disrespect to any of my uh, illustrious colleagues, there's no rise in these things. These things simply were not reported. Go and look at the work of Ginsburg called 100 Years of Lynchies. Think about how many times lynchies were simply not reported. And when we look at his particular book, we see folks get lynched for saying hi. 
We see folks getting lynched for walking down the street. We, get, we see folks getting lynched for laughing in public. This is the real thing, which means that what is happening is that there's a system, again, of racialized violence that needs to control the bodies of black and brown people. A system of patriarchy, patriarchal violence that needs to control women. And so we should not be surprised at any of the things that we essentially see. Now, I always hear people say, oh my goodness, all of this stuff started with the previous president. No, it did not start with the previous president. So we can go back and look at the people who are the so-called founding fathers. Look at what, what so-called George Washington said. Look at what Thomas Jefferson said. Right, in fact, we talk about the notion of inclusion. Go back and read the Constitution. That's what I said. It was the con. The Constitution. When you start looking at who was systematically devalued, systematically excluded, this was the cornerstone of the democracy. And so, my time is up. I apologize. I, I, was, I haven't got excited yet. I apologize, my friend. I'm sorry. I want to make sure I watch my time. I think that means that's the four minutes I had. Here I talk about my time. And I can now on and enroll in Henry Ford College just so I can listen to one of your lectures.